Hello, my name is Raven Liesfeld, and today I'm going to be talking about dyslexia. Logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. Today, I'm going to be talking about cause and effect, benefits of dyslexia, treatment, and other specific learning disabilities. Dyslexia is the most common specific learning disability. If you have dyslexia, your reading and writing will be greatly affected. Dyslexia is almost always inherited from a direct family member, and one in, people, and one in five people have dyslexia, and three million get diagnosed a year in the U.S. For dyslexics, there's 40 ways to see the word, to see most three-letter words, such as cat, and even copying written sentences is hard. If you have dyslexia, you're more likely to get diagnosed with another specific learning disability. Every case of dyslexia is different, so some people will struggle with both math and re reading and writing, or just reading and writing. And with dyslexia, you are usually get your lefts and rights mixed up. Other specific learning disabilities. ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, affects your attention span. Dyscalculia affects your math skills. And dysgraphia affects your written expression and handwriting. Benefits of dyslexia. If you have dyslexia, you are right brain dominant, which means you're very good at drawing and puzzles. Famous dyslexics. Leonardo da Vinci, a famous Renaissance artist and inventor, had dyslexia. Henry Ford, a famous car maker, had dyslexia. Tom Cruise, the most top grossing actor in the world, has dyslexia. Albert Einstein, a famous scientist, had dyslexia. Steven Spielberg, a famous movie director, has dyslexia. And Damon John, a famous entrepreneur, has dyslexia. Orton Gillingham is how you teach people with dyslexia. It is one-on-one -on -one and multisensory. It is the best way to teach dyslexics because of this. And it was developed by Dr. Samuel Orton and Anna Gillingham. Dyslexia affects many people's lives in good and bad ways. People with dyslexia are usually underestimated, but in actuality, they are very creative and smart. Dyslexia has affected me in so many ways, my brother being diagnosed and me actually learning what he goes through with this project. Expert has been an amazing experience learning all these things and being able to figure out what dyslexics go through. If I had to pick another big research project, dyslexia would probably be my first pick. Image credits, more image credits. I'd like to thank my parents for helping me along the way. Ms. Kaylin, Ms. Linton, and Mr. Hamilton for being my expert teachers. James for mentoring me and editing my paper. My brother for inspiring me to do dyslexia. My classmates for occasionally helping me. And Robin Hegner for being my interviewee. Thank you. I will now take any questions you may have. Sutton? When you say that Orton Gillingham like affects multisensory reading, mm -hmm. what do you mean by multisensory? Because I thought like dyslexia only had to do with your eyes and the way you see things. Uh, actually, dyslexia has nothing to do with your eyes. It's actually your brain. So uh, you see perfectly fine, but in your processing it is um, where things are messed up. And uh, Orton Gillingham is just it, it's multisensory. That means, uh, so that's how you teach. So it'd be like, um, like relates one sense to the other or something. Yeah. Um, let's see. Abhishek. Um, so when I was wondering, you were saying like sometimes, um, the, you were saying that it can, um, dyslexia dyslexia can uh like when you have dyslexia you can there are possibly additional um conditions can there also be some 
since you were saying that they're uh, really creative, can there be also be um, something like, can they also get a condition like synesthesia or are those like not related? Uh, not related and dyslexia, it's a specific learning disability, not a condition, you don't like catch it. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lex, no, Joshua. Um, is, isn't the last person that you said that has the Alexia, isn't he a shark? Uh, I'm yeah. Sure I think. Yes, he is. I've got time for one more question, and it looks like it is Lex. What country is most affected by dyslexics? Uh, I mean, it's, it's really just how much how much of a population there is because it doesn't vary from country to country. It's just how many, it's more likely if there's more people in a country, there'll be more dyslexics because, and next up is Birdie. Hello, my name is Birdie Casey and for the expert project, I chose to reach this for the Galapagos Islands. Tonight, I'll be talking to you about the ecosystem of the Galapagos, birds, land animals, marine animals, plants, and Charles Darwin. Ecosystem. The islands are 600 miles west of Ecuador. The Galapagos consists of around 200 rocks, islands, and islets. The temperature of the islands is normally around 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature of Galapagos water is around 65 degrees Fahrenheit. There are 21 volcanoes on the islands, 13 which are active. The latest volcanic eruption was off Hombre on January 6, 2020. Birds. Blue-footed boobies have blue feet, which is caused by their diet, which consists of carotenoid pigments. They are endemic to the islands. Frigate birds are outstanding fly flies. Male frigate birds have a large red sack under their neck, which they inflate to entrap the mate. Darwin's finches are the best known for being one of the animals who inspired Charles' theory. Their diet consists of small insects, nuts, and plants. Swallow-tailed gulls have a large ring around their eye. The ring helps them see at night when they hunt. They are the only gull that hunts at night. Land animals. There are 15,000 individual tortoises on the islands. There are three Galapagos tortoise species on the islands. The saddle-shaped, dam-shaped, and giant tortoise. Sometimes landing flies can live up to 60 years. The Galapagos iguana is endemic to the islands. Sally Lightfoot crabs are one of the world's best-known crabs. There are other crabs on the islands besides the salad lake, such as the fiddler crab and the ghost crab. Marine animals. Dolphins are highly intelligent marine animals and are part of the family of toothed whales, which includes orcas and pilot whales. There are two species of dolphin that live in the waters of the Galapagos, the common dolphin and the bottlenose dolphin. Whales eat squid, fish, seabird, sharks, seals, polar bears, porpoises, and even other whales. All whales belong to the order Cetacea. On the islands, there are over 200,000 individual iguanas. They are the only iguanas that swim. Marine iguanas can live up, stay underwater for one hour. Plants. Some prickly pear cacti can grow up to be three feet in height. The candelabra cacti flowers are eaten by finches, land iguanas, mockingbirds, and lava lizards. Scalizia trees are one of the many flora endemic to the island. They are one of the 250 endemic species on the island. They live in the Scalizia zone. The Scalazia zone is a cloud forest. Darwin's cotton lives on all the islands. It is believed that the cotton arrived by the wind. Darwin's cotton is related to sea island cotton. Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin went to Cambridge University to become a minister. In 1831, his bot botany teacher asked Charles to go on a two year voyage instead of going back to school. Charles agreed, and the HMS Beagle set sail December 27, 1831. Charles only went to four of the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands he went to were Isabella, Santa Cruz, Fernandia, and San Salvador. He stayed for five weeks in the Galapagos Islands. The ship was docked in England October 2, 1836. He wrote many books on the theory of evolution. Darwin showed that living things constantly produce more offspring. He said that no two species are alike. It was one of science's most brilliant theories. Conclusion. Expert has been an amazing experience. It has taught me a lot about writing and organization. If I had to do expert again, I'd probably focus more on the endemic species and how they arrived in the island. 
see on my image cards. Image cards continue. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Have a chat. Um, so with the frigate bird, do they kind of just like puff out their like when they're puffing when you said like they puff out their chest, do they kind of just like breathe out almost or like how do they do that? Hold on now. Thank you. Are About how many tourists um, come each year to the Galapagos? Um, probably not a lot, maybe like 5,000, because they don't, because they're, it's like a national park, so they're like, they don't have many come, so it doesn't matter you're in the zone. Okay. Is that? Um, so it, are there more animals on that island than what you said? Yes, there's a lot more. Okay. Next up is Henry. Good morning. My name is Henry Hubbard, and I'll be talking about the history of Scotland. I first became interested in this topic when my grandfather took us to Scotland one year to show us our ancestry. My biggest question coming into expert was, what was life like, what was life like for Scottish people? Tonight, I'll be covering ancient Scotland, the Middle Ages, 15th to 18th century Scotland, and modern Scotland. In 14,000 BC, the first people came to Scotland. These people were mostly nomads who soon settled and quickly inhabited a, inhabited a large part of Scotland. They started farming and hunting in large communities, but did not evolve much until 900 BC. No one else came to Scotland until 850 BC. The Celts came in 850 BC with the Vikings invading soon after in the north. The Romans came into Scotland from England in the early AD. The Scots had to learn to def the Scots had to learn to defend themselves. They formed clustered communities and came together in clans. Clans were like families with a chief, warriors, and farmers. They worked together and were fiercely loyal. Another defense was a castle-like building, which were invented to defend from the Celts. They were open at the top, allowing arrows to be shot down. They were also extremely sturdy. Early castles were made of wood and were lived in by lords and nobles. Lords were like kings with their own part of land where they looked over a burg. Burgs, based on European ideas, were where merchants and peasants lived. Bishops also owned parts of land where they built churches. In the 15th and 16th centuries, many new things happened, including the belief of witchcraft. Many people were killed by this idea. Also, by the end of the 16th century, the Parliament was introduced, which is how the kings ran the country for 200 years. Soon into the later centuries, Queen Mary took rule of Scotland. Many people disagreed with her and formed a rebellion called the Jacobites that rebelled in 1745 and two other times that failed. Also introduced in the 17th and 18th century was a new polite way of life. People greatly changed because of this. In the early 20th century, the World Wars hit. The first war held 74,000 Scottish casualties, with the second killing over 34,000 Scots. They were devastating. But soon after, Scotland went through change. People became more independent, more towns were built, and modernization hit everyone. But that is not all that happened. Between the 19th century and the 21st century, Scots were known as the inventors of the world. Many useful things were invented by them. The phone by Alexander Graham Bell, 
The Raider by Heinrich Hertz, and The Bike by Kirk Backstreet Macmillan. Other inventions include two types of boats, iron bridges, and factory machines. Overall, my experience in expert was fun. I found my answer to my biggest question. Scottish life was hard, dealing with, dealing with invaders and diseases. I am glad I chose this topic because it was very enjoyable. Here are my image credits. Image credits. I would like to acknowledge Ms. Kalen for helping me research, Ms. Linton and Mr. Hamilton for helping me understand expert, my parents for making me do my homework, my peers for helping me along the way, Professor Chris Bischoff for letting me interview him, my grandmother for being my second reader, and my mentors, Aaron and Sarah, for looking over my papers and giving me corrections. Thank you for listening. I will now be happy to take any questions. RF. What was the most common disease that they faced? Um, probably mad cow disease, which is still in Scotland today. What is that? Um, it's this disease that um, it makes cows basically go crazy. Um, and it kills them, and and humans can be infected by it if they eat poor meat from that cow. Okay. Isla? Um, are there still old clans today? Um, I don't think so, no. Thank you. Abhishek, then I'll have time for one more. Um, what did you mean when you said they began a new polite way of life? Um, basically what happened was people started to come out of their clans and live in much bigger communities. They started wearing new clothing and eating new foods. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Brenda. So does Parliament still run the country? What? Does Parliament still run the country? Uh, no. It stopped over 300 years ago, but there was a, actually, the last meeting was in 1999, held by Queen Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for listening. Next up is Mary. Uh, my name is Mary, and for my expert project, I chose to research horse breeds of Europe. When I started expert, my main question was how these was how three horse breeds could impact many other breeds all around the world. I will be talking about Andalusians, Lipizzans, and their the Spanish Riding School and Thoroughbreds. The history of Andalusians. Andalusians are descendants of the Iberian horses. The only true Spanish blood left is at the Imperial de Lipiza stud with the Lipizzan stallions in Austria. The Andalusians are the ancestors of many breeds all around the world, including the quarter horse and the Lipizzan. In 1912, their name was changed from Andalusian to Pura Raza Española. Modern Andalusians. Modern Andalusians compete in bullfights with Rey Hanadoros. Their predominant color is gray, and they have good endurance because of their short legs and liveliness. They have beautiful curly manes and tails. The history of Lipizzans. Lipizzans are based on six stallions. Favre, Neapolitano, Pluto, Siglavi, Massatoso, and Conversano. The breed was developed in Austria. In 1942, the Spanish riding school was moved to Czech Czechoslovakia because of World War II, and the breed almost went extinct but was saved by American forces. Originally, 
Lipizzans wear many colors, including spotted and bay. Modern Lipizzans. Traditionally, pure blood Lipizzan foals have two names. Their first name comes from their father's bloodline, and their second from their mother's bloodline. Currently, the breed is considered rare, and their predominant color is gray. Their average height is 15.1 to 16.2 hands high. They have clean joints, but are not very fast. The Spanish Riding School. The Spanish Riding School is where Lipizzans perform and was built by Charles VI. Lipizzan foals are born at the Lipizzan stud and spend their first three years there. Then in the summer every year, the six best three-year-old colts get chosen to go to the Spanish Riding School where they will train and perform. In each performance that Lipizzans do, there is one dark stallion, representing when Lipizzans were many colors. Hannah Zeidelhofer was the first woman rider. The history of thoroughbreds. For the thoroughbreds, there are three man, main foundation sires, the Darley Arabian, the Burley Turk, and the Godolphin Bard. The breed was developed in the 18th century, and King Stephen of England was the first to breed them. Modern thoroughbreds. Thoroughbreds have always raced, and they are the fastest breed in the world. They're one of the. They're also one of the bravest. Some thoroughbreds even try to finish races with a fractured leg. They have a well-proportioned head and all solid colors, including dun and roan. Through my research, I learned that these breeds help to develop and refine many other breeds all around the world. Image credits. Image credits. Acknowledgements. I would like to acknowledge Miss Kaylin, Miss Linton, Mr. Hamilton, Miss Shanti, my parents, my classmates, Hannah Zeidelhofer, Meredith Porter, Lila, and Acadia. Thank you. I will now be happy to take any questions. Abhishek. So what made these horse breeds so special? Well, thoroughbreds, they're a really common horse. And I just wanted to know, well, they're really common and they're racehorses. So that's why they're really special. And then the Lipizzans, they basically do, they really do, they do really fancy like movements like in Austria. And then for the Andalusians, they um, are just the ancestors of so many breeds. Okay, thank you. Miss Linton? Could you tell us what it looks like for a horse to be competing in a bullfight? Well, so the rider, um, they have. Well, I didn't really research that part of the Andalusians that much, but. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. Luca? Luca? Um. So, what's, what's your favorite type of horse? Um, probably the thoroughbreds. And how many types of horses are there in the whole entire world? Um, I, I'm not sure, but it's over, like, 500. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next is next is William. Good evening. My name is William Hendrick, and for my expert topic, I chose to research human evolution. Tonight, I'll be talking about body changes, tools, art, migration, and anthropology. As I research this topic, I've often wondered, why do we evolve? Why are we so much more advanced than other species, and how similar are we compared to each other? Our larger skulls have let our brains dramatically increase in size and change in shape as well. This larger brain has created a much more complex thinking process, leading to a hierarchy over other animals. Our brain has caused hair loss because a large brain overheats easily, and to prevent extreme exhaustion, our body will lost a majority of its hair. Our skull was most definitely not the only thing to change. Our average height grew from roughly three feet to around five or six. Our spine needed to be more flexible to reach low places as our bodies were growing much taller, which is why we developed an S-shaped spine. And our feet needed to adapt so we could become bipedal or walk on two feet. Tools were used for a variety of things, including hunting, farming, rituals, and gathering. Different tools would be used for different things. For example, a spear would be used for hunting, while hand axes would be used for gathering resources, and a sickle would be used for farming. Making a good tool is much harder than it may seem. First, you need to find a good rock, ideally obsidian, because it will last much longer than other tools. Sometimes our ancestors would walk 10 miles just to find the right rock. You would need to bury the rock underneath the fire to soften it so you could shape it easy, easier. To shape, after that, you need to chip off flakes of the rock and shape it into what tool you would want. Then you would use a bone and tap out the finishing touches. Cave art can be found all over Europe. However, a majority of paintings are in Western Europe, namely Spain, Portugal, and France. A well-known spot would be Lascaux, France. The image you see here was found there. Cave paintings often depict animals that roamed many years ago and hunts and, and then people migrating as well. After caves became obsolete and people started making towns, art became different. Beads, pottery, and sculptures were made frequently around this time, many of which were heavily detailed. Our ancestors started in Africa, which makes us all African. I find this quite interesting. Then people moved to Europe, then Asia, Australia, and later the Americas. Anthropology means anthro, meaning human, and pology, meaning study. So anthropology is the study of human civilization. This topic is vast because there are so many different ways to study it. You could study language, modern or ancient behavior, even the rates of certain things like population, violence, or, or maybe even the minerals entering the body, which could potentially create the perfect meal and nutritional value. Here's my image credits. I'll be now be taking any questions you may have. Um, Sophia? Did they create boats to go across the sea to the Americas and all that stuff? Um, to get to the Americas, there was actually a land bridge that was frozen over towards over north on over around Greenland. So they actually didn't have to make boats to get over to the Americas. Wow. Um, Nolan? Why did you choose this topic? I mean, I've always found it interesting about how, like, we came from apes, and I'm like, how did that happen? So I've always been really curious about how, what went up leading up to us. So that's why I chose this topic. Uh, okay. Abhishek? Um, so how, how did they make pigments for cave paintings? And um, can you possibly walk us through um, that, through that process? Okay, so there were certain rocks that you would crush up, and they would make kind of like a powder. And once you could just smear the powder on the wall, and that would kind of act as the pigment. Okay, so like kind of like chalk. Kind of like chalk, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have time for one more question. So Sutton? 
So you said that there were like many ways to like research anthropology, like the language, the development, mm -hmm. the population rates or whatever. What would you say the most common and the most popular way to research them is? That is very difficult. Um, mm, wow, that is very difficult. Um, it might be linguistics, which is language, but it might be just cultural, just like rituals and stuff like how they acted and everything that is really difficult i'm not quite yeah. sure on that that's a very hard question <laughs> thank you. okay thank you oh next up is francie mckay Good evening. My name is Francie McKay, and I have chosen to research Julia Child for expert. Today, I'll be talking to you about Julia Child's time in France, the cookbook she wrote, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Julia Child's Life on Television, and Julia Child's Legacy. Julia Child was born in Pasadena, California, August 15, 1912. Her family had private chefs, so she never felt the need nor had the opportunity to cook. Julia's husband, Paul Child, was offered a spot in the American Embassy in Paris, and the child's relocated. Julia, without a job, went searching for a new hobby to pursue. Paul encouraged her to sign up for the Le Cordon Bleu, a cooking school. Julia loved eating French food, so she decided to try the Cordon Bleu. Julia arrived for her first day on October 4th, 1949. The year-long class she, she had signed up for was much too simple for her, so she decided to talk to the manager. The manager, Madame Grassart, would not let her take the six-week class for experts about what she had applied. Instead, she told her to take the year-long class for professional restauranteurs. Julia was the only woman in the class, and her culinary skills improved tremendously. She learned that cooking was a rich, layered, and endlessly fascinating subject. Mastering the Art of French Cooking In the 1950s, Julia Child met Simone Beck who often went by Simca at a ladies' lunch. Simca had also taken many classes at the Cordon Bleu. Julia was introduced to Louisa Perkel, one of Simca's close friends and colleagues. The three shared a love of food and cooking, so they became friends. Simca and Louisa had been in the process of creating a French cookbook for Americans, but they needed an American to help them. When they met Julia, they both agreed she was the perfect choice. Julia loved the idea, and they set to work. The three created Le École de Trois Gourmands, a cooking school for Americans, teaching let them work out the recipes and methods while helping others learn how to cook French food. Once the book was completed, they faced a new problem, finding a publisher. Judith Bailey was an editor who worked for Knopf, a publisher in New York. In 1959, Judith happened to find Julia's book and loved it. It was titled French Recipes for the American Cook but was later renamed Mastering the Art of French Cooking and then published in the fall of 1961. Julia Child on Television Julia Child began her career on television in The French Chef. WGBH, the television station she worked for, suggested they create a 26-episode season starting in January. Julia happily agreed, and with that, The French Chef was born. In 1970, Julia began working on the biggest series of The French Chef yet, they had a bigger budget than ever before, so all 39 episodes would be in color. Their plan was to shoot many documentaries in France about how traditional French food is made, followed by Julia cooking the meals. Around the time Julia started in the television business, she and Simca decided to create Mastering the Art of French Cooking Volume 2. However, after some time, Julia decided to completely devote herself to the television business and leave the book in Simca's hands. Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Volume 2, was published in the fall of 1970 and was soon followed by the new episodes of The French Chef. Julia Chad's Legacy Many people may not realize how incredibly hard it was for a woman to enter a prestigious culinary program. However, Julia was up for the challenge, and her talents were celebrated. She helped break down the stereotype that women are not ready to reach the highest level of the culinary profession. The Julia Child Foundation once said that Julia Child made cooking fun, 
She inspired millions to take to the kitchen and appreciate the pleasures of making and eating good food. Julia Child wanted people to step beyond the culinary boundaries set during the war, and she achieved exactly that. Conclusion Julia Child never let anyone tell her what she could or could not do, and for that, she was truly inspirational. Julia went to a Montessori school when she was young, and she credited her love of working with her hands and other people to that. It is essential to the progression of our world that women are treated equally, just like human beings. I would like to acknowledge my parents for helping me through this, my aunt for being my second reader, Miss Linton, Miss Kaylin, and Mr. Hamilton for being my expert teachers, and Claire Stark for being my mentor. Here are my image credits. I can now take questions. Neha? What inspired you to do this topic? My mom let me watch Julie and Julia, a movie about a lady who created every single one of Julia's uh, recipes. And when I saw Julia Child in the movie, I know it wasn't the real her, but it was based on her and she was just incredible. Abhishek? Um, so I have two questions. One, what made you want to um, research Julia Child as opposed to um, like Simone Beck or her coworker? What made you want to choose um, Julia Child? Simone Beck and Louisette Berthold were both French and Julia was American. He learned how to cook when she was 32 and she was incredibly talented. And so Simone and Louisa, they never went farther than the cookbook, but Julia mm -hmm. continued to inspire people. And also, how did the, um, how did like the budget of the French chef like slowly lead up to where they could buy, um, like where they were able to shoot their movies in color? Well, the, um, well, when the French Chef was started, they didn't have, like, color videos weren't invented yet. <laughs> um, and they, it also just became much more popular after time. And Thank you. that is all I have time for. Thank you. Nancy, that was amazing, as were all the presentations. And thank you, audience, for joining us for the first night of Expert 2020. We hope you enjoyed learning about all these topics. I certainly enjoyed learning about Horse Breeds of Europe. You can learn more about these topics you heard this evening by going to the RMS website to read the papers these experts wrote. We're going to wrap up for this evening, but we hope you will join us again tomorrow night at 6 p.m. for the second half of the presentations from our six year friends, where you will hear about everything from Renaissance art to rap music and weapons of World War One.